Now it's time to kick off our very first um, conversation that's happening uh, for the festival. And it's my honor to include um, two executives that are inspiring and just so well um, appreciated and loved within this industry. Uh, first is our cherished board member, Stan Pierre-Louis, who is also the president of the Entertainment Software Association. And he's going to be talking with Cynthia Williams, who is president not only of Wizards of the Coast, but also president of Hasbro Gaming. And they're going to have a conversation about the state of the industry and where we are with games today. So please uh, give a wel uh, welcome round of applause for Stan and Cynthia. I love it. A round of applause for the walk-on music. That's always <laughs> treasured. That's always treasured. Um, first of all, congratulations to Games for Change on its 20th year here at the festival. Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah, Susanna and the team have just done tremendous work of really thinking about how to bring out the best of what we do in games, that social aspect and social good. I'm equally excited to be talking to Cynthia Williams today, um, who is president and CEO, or president of Hasbro Gaming and Wizards of the Coast. Um, I have to tell you, those are two iconic brands from my childhood and in my brain. And so it's exciting to be talking to you. It's like very, very cool for me to be talking to you about this. And I'd love to hear a little about your journey to Hasbro and what it means to represent those iconic brands. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for the conversation today. Um, they are iconic brands. When they called, I was like, holy cow, I played all of these games as a kid, most of them. Um, I did have a moment we'll talk about later with D&D. &D, but um, so I've been here about a year and a half and I do lead strategy for games like Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, our board game portfolio. Uh, we're best known for the tabletop games. We're also working on digital games with Magic the Gathering Arena. And we have several studios around the United States and Canada and a group in Poland where we're working on some really cool new properties. Um, before that, I was at Xbox, helping to grow the Xbox gaming system and focused on the creators and trying to empower creators to grow their business because all of you game designers, this industry wouldn't be here uh, without all of you. But when they called and said, hey, we have this opportunity at Hasbro, I was like, my first board game was Candyland. How, what else are you going to do? Um, and it... I feel like I am a steward of all of those great brands because they're so beloved by so many people. Everyone has the same reaction. That, that's amazing. And when you say it now, I'm even more excited, but also I think all of us are jealous that you're getting to represent and, and be a part of these brands and their growth. You know, and it's interesting, Hasbro has owned the Wizards property for almost 25 years. Um, and in many ways, they have, a, from the outside at least, these distinct communities and audiences. Um, but your role really seems to be bringing those together in this unique way. How do you leverage the communities, the experiences, the brands into what Hasbro Gaming is going to become? Yeah, the, the combination of all of the games under me just happened this year. And a part of that was we, as we started looking into the data, uh, we also saw that the same people who are buying magic cards are also buying board games. And you realize that we're all gamers. I, personally, I believe everyone in the world is a gamer. I know you talk about three billion people, but that's just the video games. Uh, I think everybody <laughs> in the world is a gamer. And if you really start focusing on your consumer and what the people who are playing, you realize that let's put all the games together and let's leverage the ideas of all the game creators to make sure we're delivering the right thing for our consumers. Because ultimately our mission is to connect people through a shared love of games. You know, Hasbro is all about joy and community. And when you, while you might on the outside think these are very different communities, people float between communities sometimes too. 
You know, there I have a lot of folks on my team who love strategy board games. They're also LARPers. They are also play D and D. They also play Magic. So, you know, we're seeing more and more a, a gamer is a gamer. Oh, you're really connecting with the crowd. I can hear little claps and losing <laughs> all throughout what you're talking about. So, so um, that's that's just so wonderful. You know, so at the Entertainment Software Association, we serve as the voice and advocate for the U.S. video game industry. And each year, we put out reports regarding the demographics and perceptions around games. And we put out a report last week um, called the um, Essential Facts About Video Games, where we talk a lot about um, what is a gamer and, and the U.S. player and, and how do we think about those terms and the like. Um, one of the things we see is that, you know, you talked about the 3 billion video gamers and now apparently 9 billion people who play games, yes. which is a better way to think it's about, way to think that, about that global it. audience. Um, here in the U.S., 65% uh, of people play games on a regular basis. And it really spans every demographic group. Um, a lot of people have a conception of what they think a video game player is, but we found that you know it's fifty percent women and men, right? It's split down the middle, um, but it's also very diverse, including in terms of age. You have just as many people, forty-five and older, playing as you do under eighteen. As you think about the audiences that you're trying to reach, um, how do you think about that global and diverse um, community in terms of how you're marketing and making games? Uh, writ large? Ooh, that's such a good question. I'm going to go at this from a couple of different ways. So if I go on too long, you can cut me off. Um, first, one of the things that we're seeing is that games are becoming multi-generational. So it's not just that you're seeing the spread of age demographics. You are seeing parents teach their children the games they loved. So I'm going to do my favorite. How many of you in the audience have ever played Dungeons and Dragons? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate you. How many of you have started teaching your children or started DMing for them? You are not alone. <laughs> it is a, a real trend. Um, when I was at Magicon in Las Vegas last October, I met so many parents who were bringing their kids with them, and they were teaching their kids to play. Stan, I know your son plays Magic the Gathering. So, you know, the images you may have seen on TV are of a parent teaching their child how to play Monopoly. But the truth is they're also teaching their children to play more complicated games than the games they loved. And that's why I think of it as being a steward because D&D will be 50 years old next year. Magic the Gathering is 30 years old this year. Um, these, are, these are games that have existed this long because of the love of the community. Now you asked about making and marketing games. To me, this is also gets into some of the workforce, but we'll talk about that later. You know, one of the things that we encourage is for our team members to tell us about the causes they really care about and the communities they wanna reach out to. And we have a product some of you may know about called Secret Lair, that is a smaller set of magic cards that are often more whimsical, sometimes experimental, but one of the things we do with them is let our, let our community within the organization say, this is a cause I care about. And there was a young woman who said, I really want to commission art from black artists around the community and create a set called Black is Magic. And we, we did that a couple of years ago and we raised money for a cause that that community cares about Black Girls Code. And so, and then the following year, we did the same thing uh, with the LGBTQ plus community, commissioned all the art from the, that community and created Pride, Pride Across the Multiverse. Those campaigns, we, we take the product, sell it online direct to consumer, and the proceeds go to the charity. For Pride Across the Multiverse, it went to the Trevor Project, and we raised more than a million dollars for that organization. That's kind of incredible. Um, part of what you're doing when you describe even that outreach is you're leaning on community and, and what we've been seeing, and I'm sure you're seeing, is that more and more people are playing together. You know, in our stats, we found that 80% of people now play games together either in person or online, which is actually higher than before the pandemic. Um, and it's more than during the pandemic because it grew during the pandemic because it's, it's been sustained. 
Um, what are you doing to both strengthen the community of players you have, but also introduce new people to these games and communities? Because you know, growth is inevitable because of the nature of these um, games and how people love them. But you've got to be intentional about how you achieve that growth. So what are you seeing in terms of strengthening the ones you have, but also building out to new players? Well, I think there's two things. Part of it is the stewardship piece. Again, it's like you have to respect the game designers. Uh, I'm fortunate that I have game designers who've been on these games for many, many years, and they know the community well. They are part of the community. In many cases, they identify more as being part of the community than as being a wizard. And I'm okay with that because I think that just keeps us in connection with the team. Now, the risk in that is you have to then have people on that team and in that com community who understand what new players need. I had never played Magic or D&D before I joined Wizards of the Coast. And so I tried. First of all, I tried in high school to play D&D &D and was told by a group of boys that it wasn't for girls. So I kind Look of- Look at you now. I kind of enjoy that. Look at me now. Look at I me kind now. I enjoy that. <laughs> And, to, and today, about half of the players of D&D are women. You know, they are girls. So we've come a long way. We've gotten further to go, but we've come a long way. Um, but so I think it's about the product being something you can see yourself in. Uh, I tell this story so that you can attract new players. Uh, we have a Wizards Play Network, which is our local game shops, generally hobby shops, uh, and when I'm traveling, I like to go to them and meet the people in the shops. And I was in Raleigh, North Carolina. We have a game studio there. We'll talk digital games in a minute. Um, and so I went to one of our WPNs that was in a historically black community within Raleigh. And I'm talking to the woman who runs the store. I'm looking around and I was asking her to tell me some stories. And I realized she had this poster of Kaya, it's one of the black characters in Magic on the wall. And she said, we keep that one up even when you send us other products because we had this couple come in and the wife said, my husband has been trying to get me to learn to play Magic and I, I just don't know if I'm so interested. And then she saw one of our sets that featured Kaya and she started to cry. And she said, I've never seen a, a game that represented me. And she turned to her husband and said, if you build me a deck with Kaya, I'll learn to play. <laughs> That's the power of representation. That's how you bring in new people, you help them see themselves. Now, the second story I'll tell is about our D&D school program. Mm -hmm. um, if you're here for the festival and you're around on Wednesday, you can go listen to the experts talk about this, because that's not me. Uh, but this past year, we launched, <clears throat> excuse me, we launched a school program that has classroom curriculum. We were just talking about how hard yeah, it is hard, to say hard that. Yeah, hard words. Hard words to say. Classroom Regularly curriculum. Regularly rural juror. Very hard. <laughs> really hard to say. <laughs> and an after school club. And we created the content uh, with Young Minds Inspiring. And it, the teachers are able to, in the classroom, you don't get to play, but they're using the D&D &D curriculum to help kids learn confidence and math and reading and problem solving. And then in the after school club, they get to play. Uh, and in the past year, we've reached 16 million new people who had not been introduced to D&D. That's teachers, parents, and students, fourth through eighth grade. And that, Young Minds Inspiring said they'd never had a program that's been this big, but to me, it's a great way for us to be intentional about helping someone learn uh, and to start from where they're at. And, and what's great about games is they spur so much, inspire so much education. People wanting to learn more about a product, how it gets made, um, and what we saw in a lot of our survey work, perseverance and all these other cognitive skills um, and emotional skills uh, that games bring on. So it's great to see that d and is a driving force uh, in making that happen as well. You know, you've, you've, you've talked a little bit about um, the diverse and global nature of the community. I know that you also do quite a bit at Hasbro and Wizards with respect to workforce. So I'd love to hear a little bit about the intentionality around workforce and why it's so meaningful with the products that you have. Yeah, you know, I think of it as in that intentionality, which is such the right word, 
It's about, you've got to be intentional about how you're writing the job description so that it actually, there, it's weird. There are words that will prevent women from applying for a job. This has been proven. Uh, and so, and there's a wonderful line Bungie uses that I want to adopt in ours that says, you may not be uh, recognize yourself as having all of these skills, but if you have at least half of them, or you believe you'd be good at this, please still apply. Uh, and it's just reaching out more to say, don't assume you have to have all of this and be perfect to apply, please apply. Then, you, then past the job description, you've got to make sure that you are reaching out to the communities to make sure that they're aware of the opportunities. You've got to make sure that the when you craft the number of people who are interviewing, that you have diverse representation of people interviewing. You have to have diverse representation on the interview panel to make sure that you're hiring the best possible talent, that you've given everyone an opportunity. And I will say, like, I'll be honest about this, as a woman who grew up in tech and then moved into the games industry, for those of us who are in the industry and are of the underrepresented class, woo, it's a burden. But I don't think of it that way. I think of it as it's part of my job and responsibility to lift others up and give others a hand up, and so we're happy to do it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I will say the thing about industry is that it is one of the few that is speaking out about it mm -hmm. and making it a headline issue um, at every company, at every level. And I think that that's a differentiator. And if you look in the marketplace, a lot of people are shy about talking about these issues. And we're one of the industries that still says, look, this is important. And when you're trying to serve that global audience, it's critical, right? You have to. I mean, I'll, I'll say again, people are more likely to play a game when they can see themselves in that game. And it, I'm not talking about just race or gender. It's, oh my gosh, Hellblade. Anybody ever played Hellblade? We got a hand. This is your guy right here. You are definitely yeah, yeah. my guy. <laughs> so I was at Xbox when Hellblade came out, and I will never forget reading some of the letters from people who suffer with mental illness and said, I played this game with my brother, and it's the first time he ever understood what I go through. That is the power of what we do as an industry. Wow. Um, you know, uh, one of the things we found in our survey is that. Um, 90% of people actually view games beyond fun as important to relaxation, stress relief, all these things. Um, and 50% uh, of people say they've met a good friend, significant other, or spouse through games. I, I wonder if you might talk about the experience you have within uh, Hasbro and Wizards on the power of games and how you think it can move beyond to uh, our global scale. Yeah, you know, we've got so many people in our company who met their spouse at a local game store or playing D&D, &D, so totally. Maybe in this audience, anybody met us, I've got another good friend or spouse through games. All right. <laughs> so I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you another story. Because, so I talked yesterday with, at the United Nations event that we were just talking about, and part of the, the core of the conversation was about a recent U.S. Surgeon General report about a health, major health threat that surprisingly is about loneliness and a lack of social connection. And that to me is where the power of games really comes through. Um, certainly with tabletop games and you're sitting across the table from someone, and you're having a conversation, you're telling jokes, you're laughing together, you're building those relationships and social connection. And that actually can help reduce health concerns like um, anxiety, depression, heart disease, and dementia. Now, I'm not gonna go out and advertise my games that way, but I do know that's why I care so deeply about finding more ways for more people to pay more, play more games. And when we talk about connection, some of it is around the table. Uh, but we also know that for those of you who said you played D&D, &D, you know that one of the hardest things to do is schedule the time for everybody to get together and sit down and play. Uh, so after we bought Dungeons and Dragons Beyond, another game industry exec came up to me and said, listen, 
how quickly can you get this translated into French? I'd really like to play with my elderly father who lives in France and you know, he can't read your English version of it. That's what we do when we're connecting people. We, we, by the games we create, the tools we create, we enable more people to connect with their family and their friends more frequently um, and give them choice of, do you want to play physically or do you want to use digital tools? Do you want to play a physical game? Do you want to play a digital game? We just have to serve all of their needs because I do believe that games, games are a powerful force for change. They're not a distraction. They're not immature. Yes, they're fun. Of course they're fun. That's what we all want to do. But games bring people together in a way nothing else can. Yeah. If, if, if this audience is, is a, a sample size of what the gaming community is, and in particular the games that you guys put out, there's got to be a way to harness that energy for good are there things that you've done within the company to think about how to catalyze this group that loves uh, this community and is passionate about the, the well-being that games provide? Is there a way that you guys have thought about harnessing that power? You know, well, that is part of what Secret Lair is about when we're doing these philanthropic drops because we try and make sure that it's a cause the community cares about. Uh, we do a drop every year for Extra Life, which is uh, to help get games to kids in hospitals. Um, and then one of the ways that I think about supporting this community and engaging them is through our Wizards Play Network stores. So I don't know how many of you game in a local game store. A few hands up. So what I see is that those stores are the community. Yes, if you go to Gen Con, yes, if you go to a Magic Con, you see the bigger, broader community. But those micro communities are the ones that really help people get through the really tough times. And so part of what, even though most of my time is spent thinking about the games, I also spend time thinking about how do I make sure that local game stores are successful because they are making sure that the community is thriving. And I do believe that you know, there's probably more we can do with that from a philanthropic set. We, we heard Dr. Lupo speak yesterday, and he was inspiring. Oh He's raised goodness. like $10 million for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. So you know, if, if nothing else, what I'd say is I know for sure that gamers, gamers give. They and they do. give back. And so thank you for that as well. They, they do. And I've spent many times in a parking lot of a local store and my son's in a folding chair playing magic for hours. So I, I, I've lived that experience. Um, I, I wonder, I, I know, look, you, there are a lot of things going on over there and you can't tell us everything, uh -huh. but I wonder if there are some things you can give us some insights into, like what are you excited about uh, over the next year of what's, what's coming out within Wizards or Hasbro? What, what can you tell us? Well, I will tell you, so part of the way we do, did, we think about games, we think about how do we give you all the expressions to play a game and the way you want to play it. So we also do digital games. Sometimes we make them, sometimes we work with other game studios because they have the expertise to make them. So I'm really excited uh, about Larian Studios' release of Baldur's Gate 3, which is coming up in weeks. <laughs> it looks amazing. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. Uh, we will have our, our first world championship of magic played in person in Vegas in September. I'm super excited about that. Uh, this All the remaining sets that are coming from magic for this year look great. I hope you all enjoyed Lord of the Rings, you know, the universe is beyond set. Uh, we're super happy with that one as well. And there's an announcement coming in December that I can't tell you about Ooh, yet, but stay tuned. A little stay tuned action. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. Um, I love the insights of what you're doing with these iconic brands and bringing them together in this powerful way. I love the insight around the fact that these audiences are the same, but identify in different ways through the medium of the games that you have. And I especially took away the importance of the nine billion 
real gamers. Nine billion. Nine billion. Nine billion. In the world. Come on, just because they're maybe playing, making up their own <laughs> game doesn't mean they're not a gamer. And, and, and I will share, um, I was recently uh, in Central Africa uh, on a family trip and uh, we got to play some board games that are not available here that were phenomenal. And so there's another world out there of more games that, that we can bring in that will excite people. So. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and, and thank you all for um, your engagement in, in this conversation. It, it made it a lot more exciting to have um, this kind of engagement on this topic that we just love and cherish. All right. Thank you all so thank much. You.